so many of us, I feel like we're drowning in data. We have way more data that we can than we can possibly manage. And, and we're lacking, as the poet T.S. Eliot said, where's the wisdom that is lost in information? I sort of appropriate that and say, where, where's the information we've lost in data? And where's the wisdom we have lost in information? I think it's quite applicable in those terms. So it's really about figuring out what the right information to collect is and how to use it to, again, achieve your, your organizational goals. Welcome to a and Healthcare Industry Group's What's Your Moonshot podcast series, where world-class healthcare leaders seek to solve big problems. Listen as we talk to today's health system CEOs about the journey to achieve their moonshots. Welcome to a and What's Your Moonshot podcast series. I'm Chris George, Managing Director in Alvarez and Marcel's Healthcare Industry Group, and I lead our hospital and health systems practice. I'm happy to be here today with my co-host for this episode, Martha Haverkamp, a senior director in our healthcare industry group. Today, we're excited to have David Vaudry, Chief Data Informatics Officer at Geisinger on the podcast. Dr. Vaudry is responsible for implementing transformational technologies and leveraging Geisinger's advanced data and informatics infrastructure across 10 hospital campuses, 550,000 member health plan, and the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. Prior to joining Geisinger, Dr. Vadre was the founding director of New York Presbyterian Hospital's Value Institute and associate professor at Columbia University Department of Biomedical Informatics. He's an elected fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and his research in areas such as clinical decision support, quality and safety and patient engagement have resulted in more than 100 peer reviewed publications. We're excited to have you here today on the podcast. Thank you, Chris and Martha. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, David. Really good to see you in the setting of this podcast, and, and thank you for making time for this today. Well, let's get started by asking you about your moonshot, value-based analytics. What is it? How does it advance bat- value-based care? And how is Geisinger optimally positioned to spearhead this form of data use? Well, let me start by describing how I see much of the work being done today in health analytics generally. Analytics teams, whether intentionally or unintentionally, tend to emphasize quantity rather than quality. Often there will be an intake process that uh, will exist in an organization. For instance, someone will request a dashboard or a report to be built. And a lot of times there's more than one intake process. That process itself is siloed and there are multiple mechanisms by which people make such requests. In the worst case, the extreme cases, as everybody is probably aware, someone picks up the phone and calls their friend in the IT department and essentially asks for a favor. I love that concept. I love having those close working relationships, but it certainly doesn't scale and it's not the hallmark of a highly reliability uh, organization or a highly reliable analytics shop. So that's number one. Number two is you've got this supply and demand problem. My team feels it every day. I'm sure every analytics department, uh, no matter the industry, There's always more work to be done than there are talented people to do that work. And so what tends to to happen, because there aren't enough resources, it's a situation where the requests are just trying to be worked through as quickly and efficiently as possible. And symbolically, the request is thrown back and forth over a wall, and sometimes communication doesn't happen as well as I think that it could. And the result is people get usually not what they need. Sometimes they don't ask for what they need. That's a a related problem. But uh, more often than not, uh, the result is someone makes a request. They don't get exactly what they want. They sort of throw that back and forth over the wall a bunch of times. And it's frustrating for both the analysts that are trying to fulfill those types of requests and certainly for the requesters themselves. So what you end up with in the best case is someone in a chief analytics officer type of role tracking measures like the number of requests requests, or or the turnaround time, how long it takes uh, to fulfill these types of things. And those are great process measures. It's important to measure, but it doesn't say anything about the ultimate value of, are we meeting the needs of an organization? Are we fulfilling our, helping to fulfill our strategic priorities? And so what we call value-based analytics, it's really comparable to value-based care. The idea is to to flip the, uh, the alignment or the incentive around a little bit and ask if we're actually fulfilling the organizational needs and providing that type of value. 
So if you think about fee-for-service medicine, where doing more work translates to often doing better financially. You know, I was at dinner last night, actually, with colleague Mark Fendrick from the University of Michigan. He gave the best analogy I've heard about uh, about fee-for-service versus value-based care. He said in fee-for-service, think of the game of golf. The more strokes, the more hits, the more I get paid. He said, I'd be the Tiger Woods of golf if it worked in a fee-for-service model. And I love that because I feel like sometimes our analytics are the same way. We track how many of these things we can get done and not whether we're putting the, the ball in the in the hole, so to speak. So, you know, I guess that's kind of the nutshell. Value-based analytics can help us in, achieve our goals with value-based care by focusing on the value that the reports, the dashboards, the analyses ultimately provide to the organization. Right. Yeah. And, and in fact, molding your data sets such that it can actually be used to drive insights is not only imperative for value-based care, it's, it's important for organizations with all kinds of contracts and even for organizations outside of healthcare. And so I'm curious, how did you use insights from other fields to come to your moonshot? And how do you see the use of this value-based analytics in other fields after? Yeah, it's a great point, Martha. It doesn't apply specifically to healthcare. In fact, one of the lessons I learned some years ago, I was taking a, a course on lean, on process redesign, and the instructor was uh, somebody that had done a, a good deal of work in the auto industry. And I remember him asking the question, because I'd studied a little bit about the, the Toyota production system and you know the beginnings of, of what's called lean. And he asked the question, he said, I've consulted for Ford, GM, Toyota, and others. He said, which one of the major auto manufacturers do you think collects the most data? And thinking I knew the answer, I said, it certainly will be Toyota. They've got this remarkable heritage of uh, using data, being a data-driven organization. And he said, wrong. That's flat out wrong. He said, Toyota actually probably collects one-tenth, in his experience at least, he said, one-tenth the data that some of their peer organizations collect. And I, I thought, well, wait a minute, how can that be? And he said, they figured out which data are important to collect and how they can make them useful. So many of us, I feel like we're drowning in data. We have way more data that we can, than we can possibly manage. And, and we're lacking, as the poet T.S. Eliot said, where's the wisdom that is lost in information? I sort of appropriate that and say, where, where's the information we've lost in data and where's the wisdom we have lost in information. I think it's quite applicable in those terms. So it's really about figuring out what the right information to collect is and how to use it to, again, achieve your, your organizational goals. And so I think that applies inside of healthcare and anywhere else for that matter. Right. And, and so, so how are you doing that exactly? If you say we're making choices, not all data, some data, like only data that are useful. Oh, that's a great but question. I, and and I, this, is my, this is my personal uh, suspicion on that is I don't think Toyota knew magically the 10% of the information out of that universe that okay. needs to be collected. I think it probably is a fair amount of trial and error, but there's got to be a willingness there to to turn things off and i can use our example here at geisinger we've you know we've been doing this for a long time we literally have thousands of reports dashboards queries analyses that have been done and and you know there's a maintenance tail associated of course with all those things and as we've been really focused over the last few years on simplifying and standardizing our work We've had to make hard decisions about, sometimes often easy decisions, candidly, about, well, this isn't adding value. Why are we continuing to, to produce this report, for instance? And we turn those things off in collaboration, obviously, with our stakeholders. But then there are cases where it's not just getting rid of the, the waste in the lean sense. It's actually identifying things that are valuable, but not high value, and turning those off as well, or you know, redirecting your, your resources, redirecting your focus, redirecting your attention to the things that are most important, not the things that are, say, moderately important. Yeah, makes me think a bit about you know, when you have the Internet of Things. And, and I remember uh, there was a startup that was pitching how, yeah, even at home when someone would, uh, with dementia or an old person would lift a teapot, there would be data on how heavy, how much muscles he used, <laughs> right? And I thought, but which doctor is going to, or which doctor is going to look at 24 hours every 15 minutes of blood pressure? So you it, have to be yeah. 
Yeah, it's an enormous so, problem. So uh, this is all about data selection. But if you want to use data, you also have to make sure that these data are good, uh, the, the quality of the data, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. uh, you told us previously how Geisinger is really unique in creating sort of a uniform data universe uh, where there's little siloization between the different departments. It's not that the surgery department has its own IT guys and internal medicine does something else. And, and I'm curious, how did you get to that point? Was that deliberate or was it serendipity? Great yeah. question. And I don't know if we're unique, uh, but we are blessed in that sense to be pretty far down that journey. We're, we're fairly mature in terms of standardizing, again, centralizing things. I do think we have at Geisinger one of the more comprehensive and robust data infrastructures, uh, at least among, among other healthcare organizations with which I'm familiar. And at Geisinger, dating back decades, literally, data have always been considered to be a strategic asset that we can use to advance our mission as a learning health system, which means we want to learn from every encounter so that the next time a patient comes through our doors, we can make their care better, safer, more efficient, more affordable, more satisfying for them, the patient, more satisfying for the clinicians and others involved, and more equitable as well. And so that's kind of the, the premise behind, I think, and that's probably not different from anyone else in the country. But we're fortunate at Geisinger to have not only a clinical enterprise with you know a pretty robust set of clinical data that we collect, but also a health plan, as you mentioned, Chris, at the outset, that covers more than half a million lives across different lines of business, Medicare, Medicaid, commercial lines. We've got one of the country's pre premier precision medicine programs, which we call MyCode. And with, with the MyCode program, we've enrolled over 340,000 people in our communities uh, who have provided many of them their, their blood or saliva. And from those samples, we've generated over 180,000 full exome sequences to be used for, for research and fed back into the, into the clinical setting to help us take better care of those individuals. So from the genomic and genetic side of things, the health plan side of things, the clinical enterprise side of things. Additionally, we've been leaders in measuring and monitoring patient reported outcomes, in collecting social determinants of health, and, and using those types of data to improve the care that we provide as well. And uh, to your point about serendipity, some of it has been, we've been on the right horses, so to speak, in uh, the early or mid 90s, we picked Epic as our electronic health record vendor. There wasn't much of an Epic back in those days, as, as most people know, but here we are, you know, two and a half, uh, almost three decades later, we're very fortunate that we've got that much information in one electronic health record system. Now, all of that to your question, Martha, I don't think solves the problem of garbage in, garbage out, but it certainly does help us to simplify, to standardize, to optimize and derive value from the, from the data that we collect. And among other things, it also helps us to track disparities in care. Uh, it helps us to improve health equity across our communities and also to promote the trust and transparency that I think are really critical with our patients or members of our health plan about what we're collecting, how we're using data, because I ultimately believe it's their data, not ours. And I think that's important for us to understand as well. Yeah. Oh, that's great. You had mentioned some, some innovative things that you're doing with precision medicine. Obviously, you've had your health plan for a while. Other organizations are, are sort of going down that same path, right? I imagine you know, as you venture into these new lines of business, that it, it creates new structures, which can create silos or more silos for an organization. How would you advise organizations that are siloed to break down some of those barriers? Breaking down silos is probably one of the most important things I, I, you know, I think we all need to do. And it's not that they don't exist at Geisinger. I think it's something we focus on and we struggle with like many do. But to be honest, Chris, I think the technology is the easy part. And that may sound odd coming from somebody with, with a tech background, but it really is people. And I think you know, breaking down silos, working across teams, all of that. I heard someone once say that the business moves at the speed of trust. And I think that's particularly important here. I think that that resonates very strongly with me. If people trust one another, if they know, first of all, you have to know somebody to trust them, right? And in a big organization, sometimes that can be a challenge in and of itself. 
Add to that the virtual work world now that many of us live in. And so I think it's more important than ever to, to build those relationships. But there are you know, vendors out there that are doing a great job, I think, in the space of data aggregation and, and standardization. We've been working in the informatics world on standards for many decades now. And I think a lot of that work is, is bearing fruit. But yeah, boiling it down, I think it's people, a little bit of process, a little bit of technology, but mainly people. Yeah. Yeah. Change management's always a big, big component. You mentioned you're sitting on almost three decades of information, clinical information, which is amazing. So of course we need to ask you about AI and, and how that might be able to be leveraged over that data set. So how is Geisinger thinking about AI now? And what do you think it's going to look like three to five years from now? Yeah, I'm excited about it. Although some of my colleagues will say that I'm measured in that excitement. The truth is we've been talking about how AI is going to transform healthcare for more than 50 years, I think, at this point. Sometimes I remind people that there were journals in the 1970s focused on artificial intelligence in medicine. And so uh, in a way, I don't want us to overhype the, the, the potential here because I think at least in the last 50 years, what we've been promising in terms of what AI is going to do and what we've actually delivered, there's a pretty big gap there, right? And I think, uh, you know, I think of the old uh, 1980s commercials about where's the beef? Like, I think a lot of people rightly ask, you know, where's the beef here? But for Gen AI, I do think it's going to have an important role to play. And, and we're particularly excited at Geisinger about things like ambient documentation, the ability to summarize information rapidly, you know, talking about that that challenge you mentioned, or, you know, it really is a blessing and a curse to have so much data. It's a, it's a failure to filter rather than a data overload problem. I've once heard it described as, but generative AI may help us with that. And then yeah. things Quickly, like drafting. What is uh, ambient documentation? <laughs> ah, is, ambient uh, documentation, you know? the, the concept that I could go and have a visit with my primary care doctor and they could click a button on their, on their phone, set it down on the table and it'll record the encounter and transcribe everything, but more than transcription, translate, if you will, the entire encounter into what, what becomes the clinical note, the progress note, the clinical documentation. Uh, we know how much of a burden that paperwork and documentation is for our clinicians. Uh, there have been many studies that both doctors, nurses, and others spend upwards of a third to more of their time on paperwork-related tasks. Now, it's hard to say that that's completely useless work and it should all be automated. I don't believe necessarily that's the case. And there are some people that have workflows that you know lend themselves more to something like ambient documentation than others. So I don't think it's a silver bullet, but we have heard a lot of positive things from around the country so far. And I do think it will be a time saver and a value add to clinicians and help them you know spend more time being doctors and, and sure. less time doing paperwork, if you will. But really back to your question, Chris, I think about, I think a lot about the hype cycle that I'm sure you're well acquainted with. You have this, what's known as the peak of inflated expectations. And then, you know, those kind of come crashing down to the so-called trough of disillusionment. And then over time it plateaus out. And I think that's the plateau of enlightenment or productivity or whatever it's called. I suspect we'll ride the same cycle. And I don't know where exactly we are on that curve. If the if we're at the peak or, or heading up that curve, or if we're already on the downhill now and we're saying, well, wait a minute, again, where's the beef? You know, I'm reminded of the uh, the Yogi Berra quote. It's one of my favorites. He said, you know, where will be where will we be in three years? So Yogi Berra said, it's hard to make predictions, especially when they're about the future, right? So I don't know. Things are changing so rapidly in this space. I'm sure none of us saw, well, I didn't see at least the whole Gen AI public. I mean, it's been, we've been talking about natural language processing. We've been talking about deep neural networks and, you know, the foundations for all this stuff. But it wasn't until just about a year ago, right, with, uh, with ChatGPT and, and the public sort of embrace of that technology that was really, really difficult, I think, to predict. And who knows what the next 12 months, never mind 36, will bring. Great. Thank you. And um, so hold your horses. Here. Indeed. I heard also that you're, you recently moved to Denville, and uh, I remember from my 
visit there at Geisinger. They're coming from New York City, of course, so we have all these trees. It was really a beautiful, beautiful environment. But it, of course, shows your commitment to the organization. And I'm wondering what other institutions in the U.S., or for that matter, elsewhere in the world, uh, do you admire for their approach in analytics? And last month, for example, we had a podcast with uh, Lehigh Valley Health. They do some prospective risk stratification play. Uh, I was impressed, but I'm, I'm wondering what's, what are your uh, inspiration sources? Thank you for that question. Uh, we're delighted. We, we did recently move to the area, central Pennsylvania, coming from just outside of New York City. And it's a, it's a different culture, to, to be sure. We loved it there. We, we love it here. I, I love central Pennsylvania. It's beautiful. We just had the, the fall season, spectacular, you know, lots of outdoor things to do. And it's just, it's a wonderful place to live. Spectacular views, wonderful people, some of the nicest people I've, I've encountered. To your question, Martha, there are a lot of great organizations out there and, you know, we learn from each other. I think I mentioned the concept of the learning health system. I think there are many people that embrace that notion. And, and part of that, to me at least, is learning from from one another, learning from others. So I have a tremendous respect for our peers in the region, um, across the country and across the world. And really I'm excited to learn and, and borrow ideas. Uh, I, I think the phrase that has been used before is to share selflessly and to steal shamelessly <laughs> the good ideas of others. And we certainly embrace that inside and outside of healthcare. I mentioned Toyota as one example. Anyone really that is marrying those principles of improving efficiency, trying to be data-driven, and then again, recognizing that data-driven does not necessarily mean more data, right? No, oh, that's great. You've got a lot of great, broad experience, and I'm sure you've got a lot of lessons learned along the way. What are sort of the top two lessons that you'd like to share with peers on tackling data that maybe we haven't touched on yet? Oh, that we haven't touched on. Uh, maybe I'll just reemphasize that last point, because I think this is a trap we all fall into that we need to collect more and more and more data. And again, Martha asked the question earlier in the podcast, and it's a good one. You know, how do you know what the right data to collect are? And perhaps we don't get to that except through the experience of ourselves or perhaps of others. But I think I would, I would just double down on that concept that more data does not make you a data-driven organization. We've got to be smart about how we, you know, leverage information and use it, frankly, to favorably influence behavior. And that might be behavior of clinicians, it might be behavior of administrators, it might be behavior of patients or members of a health plan. And, and we want to do that, obviously, in a way that instills trust and you know, brings value to all, all stakeholders and all parties. I, I think I'd probably leave it with that. Thank you, David. Yeah, I have to admit, I've never heard a podcast uh, so dense of quotes. <laughs> and I think uh, even Yogi Beer passed the review. Uh, I think I'll, I'll put on a thing that business moves at the pace of trust. I really thought it was beautiful. Otherwise, of course, your point of view on data and, and value-based analytics is clear. Indeed, more is not always better. And uh, I started my journey in the U.S. working on choosing wisely. And that's, of course, uh, the hallmark of, of that movement uh, as well. Yeah, so willingness to turn things off, select better, and have good quality through your Geisinger setup. And you have a clinic and you have a plan. So you have claims and you have uh, clinical data, which is something that's, of course, much more difficult for a lot of peers who do not own health plans. Uh, you can link phenotypes to genotypes. That's super, super special. Your EPIC or the adopter status and the fact that you do all the social determinants of health for a long time. I remember when I visited Geisinger that you, you would give carrots out on a, a recipe in the pharmacy. Um, yeah, and I think that the trust uh, part, which of course goes back to your business moves at the base of trust, trust of patients in how you use the data, that is absolute key. I love your take also on AI. I have now a lot of people around me who are writing books on AI and uh, I keep on thinking, oh, when is it coming? But I agree with your assessment that you, you really have to first see what it does before, uh, before jumping off the roof. Yeah, I, I tremendously enjoyed this. It was really uh, Really great. Chris, thank you for doing this with me. David, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. If you'll indulge me, I'll leave you with one last quote that's etched in, in my mind. We need to use technology to rehumanize, not dehumanize healthcare. I mean, we have this challenge with the digital divide that we can exacerbate if we're not careful. And I think, you know, Geisinger is really focused and many around the country are focused on health equity. 
uh, eliminating health disparities. And that one is one that, since you mentioned the, the quotations, one that I always think about. We need to use technology to rehumanize, not dehumanize care. Thanks, David. Alvarez and Marcel. Leadership. Action. Results. I thought it was great. And I agree with you. Like the amount of quotes that he had that were relevant to the conversation was amazing. He's obviously very well read. And I think we've gotten to know him a little bit in the last month or two. And his perspective is amazing. And he's got such a depth and breadth of experience that I think can benefit a lot of organizations across the country. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, Geisinger is in such a special position to do good stuff and then if they attract people like david then yeah i think that that's going to lead to even greater results yeah it's going to be interesting to see what he does right the next couple of years he's fairly new there sitting on almost three decades worth of clinical information having a health plan there's some unique components there that i feel like they really can achieve a lot of what he talked about just because of the foundation that they have and other organizations are going to be in that position in the next 10 years to be able to do similar things. So I think there's going to be a lot of lessons learned with what Geisinger does the next couple of years with us. Yeah, of course, too, people in that area, once you enter Geisinger, you probably don't leave for a long time. So they also, in addition to everything we covered, they also have very longitudinal data. Yeah. But it seems to me very scary to make the decision to turn things off or on without a good algorithm. Um, yeah. for which to decide. That's, of course, the, the, the real proof of the pudding will be, how do you do it? How does he do it? And I love your question about Danville. We'll have to check in with him after the winter to see if he still feels the same way. He probably is going to get a little more snow in Danville than he did in New York. 